see Got a biting chance So I don't need a doctor I don't need a preacher But you know what I need Only you can understand I'm a fake to see I'm a fake to see I'm a fake to see We gotta fight it Try so oh, Hello, Kako. My name is Taylor Chang, Curator of Film and Performance at the Honolulu Museum of Art, Doris Duke Theater. And it's my honor to be able to welcome everyone to this program. I'm calling in from my home in Kaimuki, Honolulu, Hawaii. Hawaii being, of course, the land of Kanako Iwi. And today's program, in a number of ways, uh, honors uh, the land and Hawaii's people through film and media. We're really proud to be able to co-present this program along with Ulu'ulu, the Henry Kualoha Juni Moving Image Archive of Hawaii. The Foundations of Hawaii Cinema program is, is a tribute to the roots of film and media making in Hawaii. We look, when we look at the work coming out of Hawaii today, it's really impossible not to see the connections to the early pioneers such as Namako Ka'aina, Victoria Keith, Eddie Kamai, Heather Juni, and many more. And so this program uh, honors the importance of archival work in preserving and bringing to life this vital cinematic lineage of Hawaii storytelling. And it looks at how current and future filmmakers engage with that lineage, with this archival process to build community and to continue to amplify Native Hawaiian voices and perspectives today. We are so honored to have Heather Hanani Juni pioneering Native Hawaiian filmmaker and founder of Ulu'u Archives here to lead and moderate today's program. Heather is a trailblazer. She has been documenting, sharing, and preserving stories of Hawaii since the early 80s, starting from KGMB TV to, uh, you know, independently um, working under Juno Roa Productions and later Rock Salt Media. She is also a founding member of Pacific Islanders and Communications. And I'm just like my heart just fills with joy to be able to introduce her as our as our moderator and leader for today's program. So thank you so much, Heather, for, for being with us. Taylor, I am honored to be here and grateful that you even thought of us and, and considered me to moderate this panel. I'm moderating a panel of friends that I've known for almost 40 years. And I have had the honor to work with them, to to converse with them, to play with them over all this time. Um, Joan Lander, Victoria Keith, both of um, uh, illustrious careers they've had, also pioneers. I would say that they are my mentors, actually. I, they're the, trail, the true trailblazers. So I'd like to first introduce a great filmmaker, Joan Lander from Namaka Oka'aina. Aloha from the Big Island and Victoria Keith from Victoria Keith Productions. Aloha everyone, thank you for having me. So we, we did a lot of work over time uh, since the, well for them it was the 70s, for me I jumped in in the 80s and we will now lead to a, um, a short video so that you can get an idea of the kinds of work that they did and it's just a sampling uh, both Joan and Victoria have um, fabulous collections that you can access on their websites separately or at Ulu Ulu. Uh, Victoria Keith's collection is in Ulu Ulu as well as Junior World Productions. A lot of them uh, have depended on the ocean for their subsistence and to uh, survive. And they found it much easier to live this way instead of, of falling into uh, the so-called system. Why do they want to come down and get all these people out? Where are all these people going to go? I don't know where I'm going. But I think the people don't just uh, roll over and die, you know, they fight back. And it took a heck of a lot for us to do that. Nobody gets involved what's, with what's happening until this thing hit us. And when we got involved, we got in, involved deeply. We had a, a hell of a lot to learn. And I think we t we've taken our lessons. I think we've taken them well. We're not gonna give up. <laughs> that's, the, that's the most important thing. I, I think the people feel that you know, nobody's giving up. 
Alulike went to the people of Waianae and asked what could be done to open up an industry long closed to the individual fishermen. And we feed the opelo, we work the grounds, the koa, and we get them to eat from our palu, our palu bag. And then once they're eating, then the hoop net goes down and we encircle and bring up the catch. I can use the word haole, I will use the word haole, and I will continue to use the word haole. This is called a, a BiPAP machine. Some guys call them a CPAP machine. This is for use for guys that get sleep apnea. The ultimate for prevention to sleep apnea is lose weight. Oh, Aumako is the shop. My family in Kalakuku Bay. My mom told me, my tutu told me, no kill a shop. Pelly's power is not ours to have to share. It belongs to her. She's not for sale. She's not for tapping. She needs to exist in, in, in her pure form. She's alive and she's active. And she needs to stay that way. She needs to have her time on Hawaii. There is simply no substitute for live firing to develop the coordination and teamwork skills necessary to deliver accurate naval gunfire support. Well, there's no substitute for Hawaiian land. We only have the Hawaiian islands. The world continues to be a dangerous place. Freedom is challenged regularly. Our nation must be prepared. What is national defense? National defense is nothing if it doesn't come from the heart of the people. George Helm said that. Activism, that is what that clip was all about. Junior Roa had a little comedy in it. I think that um, uh, both of you, well, Joan, I think you've done all kinds of different programs as well. But the important thing to note here is that Joan and Victoria spent their early life documenting important events during the 70s and 80s that have become, that were seminal events that became curriculum. I wanna to go to uh, first to Joan, who was born in Cumberland, Maryland. And I wanna ask her how she found her way to Hawaii and why she came here. Well, after graduating college and becoming involved in the um, anti-war movement and getting involved in theater production. And then I decided to jump into the anti-poverty uh, effort and became a VISTA volunteer in Colorado. So jumped further west from my college in St. Louis. And then uh, after a year of uh, working in community organizing, um, my husband at the time and I decided to come up to Hawaii. He actually wanted to come. I didn't really want to come because I didn't like hot places. <laughs> but we came out on says the a woman, says a woman. Uh, says a woman that's living on the volcano. <laughs> yeah. And on our, fl our flight out here, there was a film on, on the plane. The in-flight uh, movie was Krakatoa, east of Java. And there was a volcano going off. <laughs> and here we, we come to the big island where the volcano is actually going off. And it's still going off now. Um, but uh, we were both involved in radio at the time. And uh, we applied for radio positions and happened to land a job in Kona on this island, KKON. And then moved to Honolulu or Oahu anyway. And I got involved in the environmental movement with Life of the Land. I became um, an organizer with them and also an office manager, and newsletter editor and all that. So I was really involved with all kinds of activism in those days. And when video, small format video came along, it was just a natural jump to just using that to further the, the education, the public awareness and education. Well, you know, a lot, at the same time, Victoria Keith was thinking about coming to Hawaii and was kind of on the same track. Vicki, can you tell us how you got here and what, what first, where you were born? 
Well, I was born in Panama City, Florida. I didn't grow up there. I moved around a lot. My dad was in the Air Force, so we spent a lot of time in Alaska. Uh, so I had not had any idea about moving to Hawaii. I had a roommate in college at the University of Oregon who had come out to Hawaii uh, while I was still living, uh, we had moved back to Kentucky with my family and graduated college in Kentucky. And she wrote to me and said, come to Hawaii. I have a great job out here and it's so exciting. You can, you can listen to Kui Lee singing music on the beach and it sounded great. So I wrote away to the DOE, Department of Education. I had just graduated in August and I began teaching at Leilua High School in September. So I really uh, made an abrupt transition from one life to another. And what year was this? What year? I'm not, this was 1966. And I was 21. I turned 22 on the stage singing Tiny Bubbles with Don Ho. <laughs> <laughs> in the days when they dragged you up on stage if it was your birthday. So, uh, but I was not an activist at the time and I, I, I had studied journalism in college and I was on the newspaper staff. And I, I wanted to be a journalist. Um, so I began uh, teaching and then I later taught at Castle High School and taught journalism there. And my students made a magazine uh, we had a little grant from the Bicentennial Commission. This is 76 already. And the magazine included a lot of stories about things going on right around the area. And it was like an oral history presentation. And one of the stories was about the eviction of farmers in Waihole and Waikane. A lot of my students lived out there. And I took a leave from the DOE at that time. I, I wanted to go back to school and study journalism. And because I was still technically employed by the DOE, I was able to borrow some video equipment. And my partner, Jerry uh, Rochford and I decided to make a film about what was going on out in Waiholi. It was really exciting. There was, they had big rallies and speakers and there was a lot of momentum building all across the island about preserving these valleys for the farmers that had lived there for a long time who were threatened with eviction. So we borrowed the equipment and we began shooting our first documentary and just kind of a learning as we went. But the whole introduction to activism for me happened at that point with that documentary. And I saw the power of video uh, contributing to community empowerment and giving people voices. And uh, ironically, the person who brought the video equipment to our house uh, from the Department of Education was Joan, who was uh, doing resource teaching for the DOE at the time, I think. She can explain that. But that's how I first met Joan. She delivered our first Sony porta pack That is crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. So, um... Besides that great introduction, what um, did, did you see anybody else documenting what you were documenting at that moment? No, I'm sure there were a lot of uh, news cameras there and um, maybe you know radio or, or print uh, journalists, but no, I didn't see any other people doing interviews or looking as though they were doing more than just reporting on that day's events. We happened to make some contact with uh, some people who set us up for interviews. Uh, Pete Thompson, one of the major activists involved with the Waiholi event. And he went out and found people for us and brought them back to our camera and said, here, you need to talk to this guy. You need to talk to these people. And that was, that was how we got involved with the community and met more of the people there. We kept uh, borrowing that equipment, I think, until we finished the documentary and later went on and were able to use equipment belonging to the People's Fund. But yeah, that was, that was our first attempt foray into community activism. 
And what and what did it was it something that you you realized at that moment that that was what you wanted to do? Uh, yes. Um, actually, when we finished the documentary uh, after that, the community uh, eviction protest took place. Uh, we had sort of concluded our program. And then people began to convene in the valley and march on the day that the eviction notices were delivered. And that was such a, an intense and exciting moment to see the community and not just people from Waiholi, they were from all over the island and other islands as well. And it was really exciting um, to see people coming together for a common cause and being able to put that into film and then we took it out into the community, showed it to other community groups. Uh, they were able to use it to help with the education, general education of the community. So yeah, we finished that and we wanted to do more. And there were so many things going on. Uh, so we went to the Hawaii Committee for the Humanities because, and they didn't have any grant money. We were not in the right cycle and we didn't really know how to write grants at the time. But they said, there's a woman who has got a project. We can tag you onto her project. Uh, you can be the video component. And so it was this woman, Kathy Sherwood, and she had a project called Land Use and Lifestyle Issues uh, on Windward, Oahu. So every month she would hold a public forum in one of the districts along the Windward coastline. And we ended up making a video uh, for each public forum and starting up in um, North Shore area and working our way down to Waimanalo. And then we made another video that kind of was a composite of everything at the end. So that's, that was a great introduction to creating a video and then sharing it with the community that was involved in the making of it and bringing in other uh, public uh, officials and politicians and uh, activists and that kind of thing. And being able to show it and get community response right away um, to the issues was, was another, you know, very rewarding and exciting component. So that was like, that put us uh, seven documentaries <laughs> of activism. And then we began writing our own grant proposals and doing uh, work on our own. We were able to have the wherewithal to do that. Borrow. So, so is this when you created Windward Video? And it and well, we created Windward Video really when we started on the Y Holy. We had to call ourselves something, and that's that's what we lived in the area. We lived in, in Kaneohe. So, and did you work in on PBS, local the local PBS station? Um, we public took access? The, no, not at first. We took the Y Holy video to PBS and the person in charge of programming at the time did not think it was fair enough. We had tried to interview the, the man who was uh, wanting to develop the valley. He was not the owner, but he was the developer who had a, an agreement with the landowner. And he, of course, he refused to be interviewed. And so we expressed his point of view in the video. We did all we could to show the other side, but you know, there was a thing called the fairness doctrine at the time that was strictly interpreted in some places. And uh, PBS just did not think, PBS thought it was a little too um, opinionated, I think. So no, they didn't show it. But we did show it in the community a lot. Now the the land use and lifestyle series, I think all of those did get shown on PBS locally. In fact, I'm pretty sure they all did. So, so at this time there was um, a, a different okay. programming. <laughs> Someone else was in charge of programming by that time. Right. So <laughs> um so Joan, this is about the same time you were working with um, public access and video Lolo. Could you, and, and, but tell us about your, your, you know, the Department of Education and then how you hooked up with, uh, what, do you remember meeting Victoria? Handy heard the equipment? No. <laughs> <laughs> what I remember is, well, I belong to a video collective, as you said, called Video Lolo. First we were Video Lunny and then we became Video Lolo. 
sorry for our uh, use of the Hawaiian language like that, but anyway, um, we were a collective, a video collective, called ourselves video, you know, guerrilla, we were involved in guerrilla video. We were just doing all kinds of stuff, um, both activist stuff, plus um, just performance recording and um, the Land Use Commission hearing and just uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but um, uh, we we put on video festivals. Our first one was called Gonzo Video, and they were like more like art uh, video installations, where we would just set up just all kinds of video installations. And one of the second year we did it at the Honolulu Academy of Art, which is now the Honolulu Museum of Art. And um, <clears throat> we set up a video phone so that at one on one floor of the uh, art museum, people could see a vid uh, a television. And they were seeing people on it, and they were actually seeing people down on the on the bottom floor of the museum. And then the people down the bottom floor of the museum were seeing a TV of the people on the top floor. So pretty soon people started realizing they were seeing each other, and they could <clears throat> communicate with each other. And that's when I first saw Vicky. I first saw Vicky on that video phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so yeah, so we were involved with um, uh, keeping the public access channel open and alive, we were afraid that the cable companies who were mandated to have these public access channels might um, <clears throat> might yank them, you know, if, if they weren't being used. So our main purpose was to train people, train the community, just keep producing programming to fill those hours on the on the public access channels. And believe it or not, um, they that venue became very important in Hawaii because Cable television had an 85% saturation rate on, on the islands because of the mountains. People um, couldn't receive over the air broadcast signals. And so when cable came in, everybody signed up for it. <clears throat> and then, of course, everybody was flipping through all the channels and they would stop when they saw <clears throat> a local face or heard a local voice. You know, they'd stop and all of a sudden the community had their own channel. So it, we, we premiered a lot of our programs on public access. The public access exists today now is Olelo. Right. So, yeah, so it, you, it's had a long history here. But I know that what Vicki talked about as far as balance, um, you know, we have, we've submitted, we've had several programs on the PBS system, but never on the national PBS series, any of the national series, because of that problem with um, balance. And uh, which I thought was interesting because Pacific Islanders and Communications and the Independent Television Service, which funded some of our programs, they were put into um, existence to serve underserved audiences. And so I always wondered if, you know, if 99% of what you see on TV is, is pretty much one point of view, and we only get like one, you know, one tenth of 1% of time to present another point of view. Why do we have to split that in half and give a half of it be the other point of view? Anyway, it's um, but it's good to have balance. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying it's not, but uh, we've always considered ourselves advocacy journalists. We pre we pretty much present one point of view, but you see the other point of view most of the time because we're covering public events, public hearings, and public speeches, and we give the other you know the other sides. Their, their say in you know, most of our program. But I, I agree that fairness doctrine, which went out, I think in, uh, I forget when it lapsed, because they let the law lapse. But um, that fairness doctrine allowed us to, back in 1975, or me, to put um, public service announcements on, on all three commercial television channels in Honolulu uh, against the, the building of the TH3, the H3 highway, which was a big movement back in there, which is as, as electrifying as the Waiahole, Waikani, and Richmond and stuff. It was a big issue, people trying to stop the highway. And uh, and we had, I had gone to a, um, we had videotaped Ralph Nader in Washington, D.C. as part of a, a critical mass 74 conference was about the dangers of nuclear energy. And I saw, we were, uh, um, I saw this team from San Francisco who had produced these free speech, they call them free speech messages against uh, nuclear power and the proliferation of nuclear weapons and stuff. And so I saw that and I came back to Hawaii and said, we can do this. <laughs> and so we produced like five um, public service announcements 
which are, were really free speech messages. And I took them around to the different stations and they said they would run them because in the interest of the fairness doctrine, they had to show opposing point of view on issues. So I'm rambling here. I love the impact that both of you brought to, the, um, to Hawaii. And, uh, and I can say personally, I didn't, you know, wasn't that aware of things going on. I wasn't, um, not until I joined KGMB News in uh, 1981, and I saw how um, uh, the news was, how biased uh, the, the, you know, the major news stations were in, in their storytelling. I mean, they, I mean, of course they approached it as, um, as you know, the, a fair, the, um, they felt that they were giving fair news. But I think when you put a human in, the minute you do that, it becomes, an opinionated piece and it sways toward, toward that that way. It's just, I think it's just a natural thing. That is where at, at KGMB News is where I met Victoria Keith. And I was influenced not just by her um, storytelling um, activism, but by the fact that I had never seen a woman carry a camera or, or, or even be hired as a camera woman at the time. And so when she walked in, I just thought, oh my God, <laughs> there was a major earthquake in that building. So, you know, in terms of, as a woman in, the, in that and doing that as a career was uh, pretty amazing. The other big influencer in my life um, was my partner at the time, Esther Figueroa, who was the um, other half of Junior World Productions, who um, taught me a lot of activism as well and brought me out of my shell in that department uh and then i and then we left kgmb and or i left kgmb in 1986 january 86 and started um with uh figgy uh our first series and then never never looked back i mean it's when you get smitten and you get the courage it's you just keep producing programs and money was not uh, front and center of our um, effort, uh, messaging was front and center and storytelling, you know? So that was a different time. There were few of us that were doing it. And there was just a wealth of stories out there that enriched us. And, uh, and we had a blast, I have to say. Yes, it's been a blessing, hasn't it? <laughs> well, I can see the blessing behind you. <laughs> Tell us where you're at, Joan. I'm in our video library slash edit bay, and um, I don't know where you can see, but the picture on the far wall is of Puhi Paul, who is my partner for many decades, partner in crime. Uh, we were both we both co-founded Namaka Ukaina, and uh, <clears throat> produced many programs together. And he passed away in 2016, but he's still over my shoulder with everything I do. He used to always be the talking chief for this organization. And uh, so I kind of hate to put myself out in front now, but I'm kind of forced to. It was Victoria and Jerry that were responsible for me actually meeting Pudi Powell. <laughs> because he, they were yes. documenting him down at Sand Island during the Sand Island eviction. And I was helping them edit their program and they brought Pudi Powell in to do the voiceover narration for the opening. And that's how I first met him. So mahalo, Vicky. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I just love you guys. So let me get to the curriculum portion of this in terms of, you know, you produced all these things. They were VHS, yes, VHS tapes. And you, tell me how Joan, particularly um, you and Puhi Pao, got it into the hands of teachers um, in the state, in the Hawaii. What was your process? Hmm. Um, sorry. <laughs> well, after, after we produced several programs, we didn't actually start distributing on, distributing on VHS for a while. I kind of forget <laughs> when yeah. we started distribution. So I think that, the, the, well, I think, um, oh, I okay. Answer to that. <laughs> okay, I'll go, I'll see, but okay, then I'll go back to Vicky. Vicky, did you, um, with your like, talk about Sand Island and how you distributed Sand Island. First, in, uh, introduce what that documentary was about and why you documented it, and um, and then how you got it out into the public and into hands of everyone. 
Mm, okay. Um, we were, we were, let me start again. We were contacted by the Social Science Research Institute at University of Hawaii. Uh, they were interested in what was going on at Sand Island and they had a very small amount of money they wanted to give us to go down and document for a few weeks and then produce something and you know bring it back or get it on television. So we went down there in uh, early October. I went alone, as a matter of fact, and introduced myself to the community, asked their permission um, to film, told them what we were doing and that we wanted to give the community a chance to express their side of the story because it was already becoming a pretty intense conflict. And they were happy that we wanted to do it. And we began to go down every day for October, November, December. And then of course the eviction um, took place on, I believe it was January 3rd, it was just after New Year's. 23rd. Uh, no, January 23rd. No. 23rd. No. I think it was after the Super Bowl. They put off the eviction so that everybody could watch the Super Bowl. Mm. Well, I'm not sure about that, but whenever it was, it, it seems to me it was right after the holidays, but whatever. Anyway, uh, yeah, so once that eviction took place, um, we put together the community wanted a short version to take around and use for community education purposes to rally uh, support for the cause. And we edited, uh, that's when we first met Joan or when we first went down to, to edit with Joan just to put a rough cut together. And then Jerry, my partner and Pui Pao on, known as Abraham Ahmad at the time, they went out together a lot, um, putting all the equipment in the back of our station wagon, <laughs> uh, including the playback deck and everything, and going to different community groups and showing the video, this short rough cut. Um, the eviction had already happened, but still the, they wanted to kind of hold together and see if they could influence the political process to you know, eventually create something like what they had wanted, which was a, a living park, cultural park. So that was, at first, that's what happened. And then uh, I applied for a grant with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. That same year, it was a call to independent producers uh, for a new series they were putting together called Matters of Life and Death. And it sounded like a perfect opportunity to apply for something to, to really edit the Sand Island tape together the way we wanted to. And so we applied and we used the rough cut as a, a sample reel to send in. And I think there were like 800 applications uh, at the time. And we were one of tw I think 22 or 23 chosen to be included in the series. And so we got a grant to do that and basically to re-edit the video, but it had to be a certain length because the, all of the programs had to fit within the format for that series. So I think it was 26 minutes was the longest it could be. Uh, had wanted to do so much more with it because we had so much wonderful footage, but we did the 26 minutes and it was broadcast uh, nationally, uh, eventually. It took a couple of years for the whole um, PBS system to get its act together. There were some stations that kind of resisted showing because the series was, you know, it was very unconventional, <laughs> uh, not necessarily always very fair. So uh, ours included. But anyway, it did get distributed nationally. And actually, you know, uh, Joan 
Joan and I and Jerry, we were working together on another project at the time that we delivered the video to um, Corporation for Public Broadcasting in New York. So Joan, Jerry, and I actually delivered the One Inch Master to the CPB uh, together in 1982, I think it was. And then it was eventually shown nationally in early 1983. Is my memory, if my memory serves me correctly. But as you, as you can see, our, our paths have crossed and been linked, and we've worked together on other projects, even after I, after Windward Video disbanded and I began working independently. Um, and we still worked on projects together. I for them, and sometimes they would be camera and audio for me. And so it's been a long and wonderful, um, professional and personal relationship. I'm so thrilled and I'm gonna ask you something that's just completely uh, different and not different. Um, as two holy women in, uh, in this profession on this island, choosing to work um, on uh, cultural programming, documenting activities, activism, Hawaiians over the years, um, do you, what drew you to, is there anything particular that drew you to the Hawaiian community to, to document because, 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 because of you folks, you documented and with your partners documented a really important events. And, um, and there wasn't a, a, a color thing about who was behind the camera doing it. But over time, there was a movement to um, create opportunities for Hawaiians to do their own storytelling. Was there any conflict that you ever had around that, that you felt or that um, you want to, uh, you can just share with us or not? I like to think of the world as colorless, but it's not. Mahalo, Heather. I very much felt that as a producer, uh, wanting so impressed with the wisdom and the aloha of the Hawaiian culture and how it was being so totally trashed in these islands all the um, the land alienation that was happening, the taking away of rights to live on, in, on people's homeland, the rights to their water, everything was just screaming at me to be documented. But I did not feel that I should be the one as a newcomer and outsider to the culture um, to do that. So another reason I have to thank Vicky is that I met Louis Paul and he, as Vicky had said, had seen the power of that Sand Island video <clears throat> taking it around the community and he wanted to do more. He was he had the same thing. We all felt that, that, that it's a very powerful medium. And he wanted somebody to um, to work with. And that's when we met. When we met, all of a sudden I had a passport into doing Hawaiian programming and he had somebody that could help them technically. And so it was like a perfect uh, get together. But yeah, um, and I still feel that that outside producers um, should follow a certain basic protocol instead of coming in and thinking they can just shoot and, and, and go off and make their programming and have no accountability to the people in the community that they document and record. So there's a lot um, to be learned in that field. Well, I know you both have such aloha for this island and I miss Victoria so much um, having left recently. Not that recently, but well, I, I I can speak to your question. Uh, we were attracted to issues, you know. That was the thing that that led us more communities, communities under duress and in stress, and most of those communities um, turned out to be with high percentages of. Hawaiian people. I mean, this was the 70s, was the beginning of the so-called Hawaiian Renaissance. Lots of issues and lots of um, grassroots movements toward evolving those issues. Uh, so I did, I did, uh, you know, venture toward that. And the way I dealt with my not being of the culture was to try to uh, make sure my crew was and I whenever possible 
in fact, almost always, uh, the crew is, is highly representative of the population. And I have had some problems. I mean, I, I have had some issues um, that I took upon myself. I mean, at, at some at some point, I decided it was probably time for me to not continue, you know, making documentaries about Hawaiian issues. It's not because I didn't want to, but because by that time, um, I was moving into issues that were the last thing I did had to do with sustainability on the islands. And of course that involves Hawaiian culture, it involves, you know, all sorts of things. But I, I felt as though at that point, there were enough other people out there making documentaries who were Hawaiian, who were from the culture. And it was maybe a time for me to step back and uh, that's what I did in 1997, after finishing um, the sustainability living on islands documentary. I, that's when I went back to teaching and I taught video production at Castle High School and uh, continued on in the DOE again after that. I have to say, the work that I did, the people that I met making these various programs through the years were, wow, well, they were just the most wonderful people and shared so much with me and uh, just made an unforgettable life that I, I really treasure. I, I always say I, I happen to be um, in the right place at the right time, but really we didn't, we didn't have a clue about <laughs> what we were doing at first, technically, we really learned on the job and we made a lot of mistakes. So we recorded over video that we wanted to keep accidentally. <laughs> uh, just many, many things, you know, but um, we had a, so much help along the way from other people. And it was really the, just the, the importance and the beauty of the land, the water, the people that we were able to capture for a while and able to give voice uh, to those that were seeking a way to express themselves, communities. So anyway, it was a wonderful time of my life. I had to take a lot of other jobs. Uh, you know, I, was, I had two children. I was by now working on my own and so yeah, I went to KGMB, was lucky to get a job there for a few years. I had other jobs in television, worked for Hawaiian Electric Company for a year, shooting for them. And uh, so I had a lot of other wonderful experiences in television, but making documentaries, it was, it was just the best life. So, so thank you for sharing that with us. And let me just follow that up with, um, these organizations that you worked with during that time, did you feel anything about being a woman in that, uh, in that role that, that, that uh, you had any difficulties with at the time? Uh, no, not really. Uh, you know, KGMB met, might be the possible <laughs> exception. Uh, it, it was a very male environment. Um, you know, I had other like 12 other camera operators and they were all men. Uh, of course, the management was male. Um, so yeah, I was the first one and there was a little resistance, I think, among some of them. Uh, and of course, I was nowhere near as experienced or trained as they were. I did a lot of on the job learning <laughs> in that job too, but it was a great job. I mean, I ended up really loving it. Uh, and the crew really came around. I, I'm still good friends with a lot of the camera guys that I work with there. And just the whole, the whole ethic of working in TV news, it's, it's quite a family and it's, it was really fun and exciting. You know, it was a different experience altogether. Uh, 
I really had to sharpen my technical skills. <laughs> when you have to work so quickly, you don't have time to deliberate in an edit room the way I was used to doing. And you have to always, you know, got to make sure everything is working all the time with the gear. But it was fun. It was another really great experience. But I think, uh, you know, my other jobs were institutional. I worked for Maui Community College as a video producer for a couple of years. And uh, really, being a woman was not, not a big deal in those cases. It was the 80s by that time, and we were more advanced. Why not much, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> as I move on, I just want to also talk about the weight of the cameras that you had to put on your shoulders. The three of us were all shooters mm -hmm. and, uh, and those cameras were extremely heavy. Mm -hmm. Not just the camera, but the battery pack, the tripods, you had to carry everything just all at once. How did you folks manage that? How did I manage it? I have no idea. <laughs> I was younger. My, yes. My, my lasting memory is um, being at the summit of Mauna Kea, almost at 14,000 feet, in the middle of the night, <clears throat> hiking into Lake Wael with Puipa. We're both carrying like a total of uh, 50 pounds of equipment. It's freezing cold. It's below, below 30, you know, below freezing. And we were trying to capture um, the Leonid meteor shower <laughs> reflected in the surface of Lake Wael. <laughs> And all I can remember is, usually you're up at a half, I mean, up at that elevation, there's only like 50% oxygen then at sea level. So even if you're not carrying anything, you're kind of struggling to breathe. But here we're carrying this equipment. And then we ended up choosing a night that it was, well, we couldn't even get the shot because there was a moon that night, which was kind of obliterating, obliterating the meteor shower. And coming back at one o'clock, trying to hike out of there, we, we could take one, two steps and we had to stop and take a breath. And I'm thinking we could both die right now, of heart attacks, and nobody would even find us for another 12 hours or so. So anyway, yeah, it was, it was hard. It was hard carrying all that equipment into the rainforest and, you know, shooting out of helicopters and off of boats. And, I, and my, you know, my body has paid for it. <laughs> I don't know about yours. <laughs> well, uh, the only time I had to do all of that by myself was when I worked in TV news. And uh, the gear bag, the deck, the camera, the tripod, all of those things had to be carried by one person, which was me. Uh, and the hardest things were like a shooting a baseball game. You know, you have to walk up into the bleachers to get that high angle, and carry all that stuff up there. It wears you out. I, you know, I, I was, I was kind of glad to not have to do that anymore. <laughs> um, but every, every cameraman and camera woman, uh, we all went to see the same chiropractor, and we all went <laughs> <laughs> once a month at least. <laughs> Randall, she's well, retired. <laughs> he's retired. Yeah, you know. I, know. <laughs> I saw him last time I was on the <laughs> island. Um, but yeah, so it required a lot of a lot of help on the spine, shoulders, your back. Um, luckily, I, I, I'm okay, but I was also a swimmer <laughs> and that helped a lot. Yeah, so you all you young video makers, you got oh, yeah. it made. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, you have no idea. Even the half inch stuff, the reel to reel, a uh, little porta pack, uh, you had to carry a huge battery pack along with it. It was really heavy. So you had battery pack, the porta pack. The uh, camera was pretty light. It was just kind of dinky, actually. And the but, batteries wouldn't last long. Right. No, no. So. And, and just the whole medium of videotape. I mean, they don't even have to worry about that nowadays. But in the beginning, you had to thread that videotape, half inch reel to reel, exactly through the tape path, or you would not be recording properly. You know? Really whining? There was, all, there was all kinds of problems with tape. <laughs> oh, I can remember a, an anecdote about editing that half inch. We had a rudimentary edit system at our house in Kaneohe for about a year or so. And we edited um, a lot of our programs right there in the back bedroom and had to use um, a map counter, a little 
thing that a roller that measured and we had to measure the tape. I have Joan probably knows, probably had to do this too, but measuring the half inch tape on both decks, or, you know, like 10 inches or something and then pressing start <laughs> and then waiting until it gets up to speed to your edit point and then hitting in <laughs> edit. I was called editing on the fly and it was wild. <laughs> We're talking about the past, and this is a great this is a great transition, perfect transition into the archive. <laughs> and ooh, right. okay, so we're going to go to a little videotape that describes the collections that Uhu has. Is Hawaii's official moving image archive. Everybody get together on the clock, the hands and sing this song now. Yes, the record ribbon. Yes, the name is Cha Cha Cha. Yes, the record ribbon. Yes, the name is Cha Cha Cha. Yes, the record ribbon. Yes, the name is Cha Cha Cha. Cut your country music now. Like a fledgling bird taken from its nest, Paea did not dream this parting would take him far, far away from his valley world and from the warm bosom of Kekunui Alemoku. Participation in the Bicentennial Observance at Pu'ukuholaheo did not end with the 1991 event. Rather, it became a place to gather, a rallying point that has inspired hundreds every year since then to return to Kawaihai to reaffirm ancestral ties. Literally the birth of the earth occurring before our very eyes. Pele creates, destroys, and creates again. It is the cycle of Hawaiian volcanoes. They figured that uh, the longer they uh, held up, you know, the weaker we're going to be. But we came just the opposite. We came stronger and stronger as the days went by because we had more uh, people supporting us from outside. Uh, they figured that our issue was correct. You know, equal pay for equal work. So I thought about some unique design. What am I going to do? Especially in a time when this wasn't a popular thing to do. But it's something that I had this yearning, this desire to be alike with my ancestors, to connect. So I decided to do this tattoo of birds. And now I'd like to introduce you to additional members to this panelist today. Janelle Carante, who is our head archivist here at Ulu Ulu. Thank you, Heather. I am really excited to be part of this panel. And Leah Kihara from Kamehameha Schools. Mahalo nui, Heather. Um, I am so pleased and honored to be amongst all of you um, friends and peers and mentors. Um, so I look forward to talking story more. Matt Yamashita is from Molokai. Hello. Uh, real honor to be here with you guys today. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, no, I am thrilled that you all are here. And, um, and I think that you've just seen um, a videotape about Ulu Ulu and what the collection is about. And I'd like to, to let um, Janelle expand a little bit more on uh, what the archive is and how collections 
like uh, Victoria's and Junior World Productions end up in an archive like that? Janelle? Um, hi, yeah, thank you, Heather, for that great question. Um, like you mentioned, I am the head archivist of Ulu Ulu Moving Image Archive, and we are located at the University of Hawaii, West Oahu. And um, we have been in existence since 2009. We just recently, a couple of years ago, celebrated our 10-year anniversary. And part of that celebration was to recognize our founding collections, the filmmakers and the groups who worked with us with our pilot project way um, in the beginning of our efforts to kind of prove that we could create the first moving image archive in Hawaii. And part of that pilot project was Juni Roa Productions, Victoria Keith Productions, and the Maka Oka'aina. Um, all three of you uh, donated or contributed portions of your collection to our effort so that we could um, you know, build the first digital video collection um, based around Hawaii and local film. Um, so that was back in 2009, flash forward to 2021, and we're still growing and we're still so thrilled to um, partner with all of you and to continue to work and preserve your collections. Um, part of that procedure is at the archive. Um, it, for preservation and for access, we digitize because as you all know, you can see behind me all of those videotapes, you can see behind Joan all of those analog videotapes. Um, unfortunately, the equipment to play it back anymore no longer exists. So what we try to do at Ulu Ulu is to digitize it and to make it available online through our catalog to make it accessible and viewable for researchers and filmmakers like Leah and Matt um, so that the, your footage can continue to inspire the next generation of filmmakers. Yeah, the, um, the machines, some of them still exist, but they're being you know, pieced together. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Joan, <laughs> you see, but you know, it's, it's tough because they, uh, they need um, attention and uh, people who know how to fix them uh, are, have long um, moved on to other things. So as you know, as everybody knows, everything is being digitized. And what we do in these collections at Ulu Ulu is we, we take a lot of the um, videotapes, analog tapes that we have and, and send it to vendors across the mainland um, continent who, who have the facilities and the wherewithal to do it. Although um, we do, uh, Ulu Ulu does uh, digitize uh, a small portion of the collection at the facility, but there's so much work that is being done. And, um, and to have um, Vicki's collection for access um, for educational opportunities is pretty impressive. And, um, and to get access to um, uh, Namaka Oka Aina's collection, well, uh, you, all you have to do is go to um, uh, Namaka Oka Aina's uh, website. And we're on Vimeo now, video on demand. I'm trying to move and transition from DVD distribution to all online, but uh, it's taking a while. And Victoria, you too, don't you have a, um, a Vimeo link or a um, YouTube channel? All of my videos are on YouTube. I started out putting just five or six of them on and decided to go ahead and put everything on. I think the Sand Island video has been viewed, I don't know how many times, but many thousands of times. And the most gratifying part of it, having things online, is I get feedback from descendants of people who are in the video. Uh, they write little notes like, oh, that's my grandpa <laughs> wearing that orange t-shirt. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm able to direct them to Ulu Ulu. And I say, well, if you wanna see all of our footage of Sand Island, you can go to Ulu Ulu. Some of them have done that. So that's been a really amazing feedback loop for me is having everything there and, and reading people's comments and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's, that's been a great um, opportunity to share the videos, give back you know, to the people that want to see the historical stuff you captured in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Yeah, we're yeah, really grateful that. That's a beautiful point, tell them my heaven. Yeah, no. It's such a beautiful point that Vicki made because, you know, all those tapes have our families, there's people with families, 
And that's my main goal is mostly to preserve it for the families because I know in my own family how precious old art, old uh, film footage is and photographs and stuff like that. So mahalo to you, Heather, for not just me, the, the, all of the us. The Moving Image Archive and mahalo to Janelle for keep for doing a fantastic job running it. Yeah. I just wanted to get that out. <laughs> <laughs> mahalo. So Janelle, who um, is originally from California, went to the university, uh, attended the University of Hawaii, and then um, ended up being uh, working in an archive in California. And we were fortunate enough to um, lure her back here and to be the first archivist at, uh, at Ulu Ulu. So she's doing a fabulous job, she and staff. And now I'd like to like go to Leah, my favorite person, and uh, and introduce her. She is um, born and raised. She is was born and raised here on the island of Oahu, and is also a filmmaker. Went through a video production class uh, with a woman that I know very well, Patricia Gillespie, uh, mm -hmm. and um, who you know, Kamehameha Schools. It was uh, um, an early acceptor of. Um, of video production and they built, when they built their library, their Midkiff library back in the late seventies, early eighties, they included a television studio, which was just so, you know, future thinking. It's just a fabulous studio that, that um, generations of uh, Kamehameha students have had access to. And Leah now is in charge of that. So Leah. Well, I have to kind of tell you, Heather, that that's when I first met you when I was a student um, and I first walked into that TV studio at Kamehameha Schools, had no idea what TV, you know, video production was or anything, but just like became, you know, just so enamored and just loved it. But part of it was, you know, the space. Um, it was a full size TV studio. Like, you know, like um, it, it probably was, I think it rivaled the size of all the other, right? Um, broadcast stations uh, here locally. And so we had like this amazing playground, I guess. Um, but it wasn't just the space, it was the people. And Patricia, Patricia Gillespie, who I called Miss G, um, was my teacher and she brought in all of these filmmakers. And so um, this is in kind of like the early 90s when I'm a high school student and, you know, Heather is, you know, this is a heyday of um, Heather and Joan and Vicky. And so, you know, I have like this wonderful, like, like my vision of like video production in Hawaii is like all these like awesome, strong, independent, fierce women, you know, and, and maybe in some way it disillusioned me because that's how I thought the world was run, you know, and so, um, <laughs> but it was enough for me to be like, this is what I want to do. This is um, the career I want to go into. And so it led me um, going to the University of Southern California, USC film school. Um, which is smack dab, you know, in the middle of LA, kind of very, very classic Hollywood. And I think I got there and kind of my world was crushed because um, everything was just so male dominated. Um, documentary wasn't so much of a big thing. It was more narrative. And, and I did grow to love narrative too, but it was just like this ability, you know, this foundation that all of you provided me that has kind of like led me throughout my whole career um, and, and to what I teach my students today. So, uh -huh. <laughs> That's good to hear. Matt, Matt Yamashita is born and raised, lives till today on Molokai, a fabulous, fabulous island. Could you um, introduce yourself by telling us how you got into video production? Yeah, um, before I do that, I just want to say I feel like I'm sitting among legends and heroes. Um, so it's really an honor to be here with you guys on this Zoom call today. Um, and throughout the years, it's been, a, it's been a, as well an honor to learn from you and to work with you uh, when I've had opportunities to work with, with each of you. It's um, really appreciate that. So yeah, I'm from the small island of Molokai, 7,000 residents, um, one of the lesser known islands in Hawaii, right? And I was born and raised here. My family's been here since the 1920s. Um, I got into, I, you guys are talking about tape and those big cameras and deck to deck editing. I, I'm happy to say I got a, a flavor of that because uh, in the early 90s, I was in high school, the Molokai, Molokai farmers uh, here on island. And um, I think it was like 1993, our little computer lab 
got a Office of Hawaiian Affairs grant to buy some video equipment. Was it? I think it was like one SVHS editing deck and two cameras or something. And I was friends with the computer lab instructor at the time, Glenn Kondo. And um, I was lucky enough where he, you know, he asked me with, along with about, I think six or seven other students if we'd be interested in learning how to use the equipment because he had no idea how to use it. <laughs> so we spent the next two years basically just playing with the equipment and figuring it out. Um, and we actually did really well. You know, I think uh, myself and, and a, a few of the others in my class, we entered like, some state um, youth video contest and we took first place in like three categories, won the grand prize and it was a real boost for our confidence. And I think, I, I like to think that where that came from was just the idea that we were, we, there was no expectation or bounds on how we were expected to use the equipment, right? I mean, we were just playing with it and just telling stories and it was very, so natural and, and free flow. Um, so that, that was my start. And, you know, I always look back to that opportunity as like really a life-changing event that I'm so grateful for because, you know, from, from, from those years in high school, I knew exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And, and like Leah, ended up in Southern California. I went to Chapman University Film School um, got a taste of what, you know, what that's all about. And I was disillusioned myself. Everything up there was about feeding you into Hollywood. You know, there was very little mention of documentary film work. There was definitely very little mention of using film to help tell um, stories to protect the environment and preserve culture and the things that we are all very passionate about here on this call. Um, so, you know, after four years, I was like, I'm out of here. I wanted to go back to Molokai and, and figure out how to do film. And I, just like in high school, I kind of had to start all over because there's no film industry. I had no peers here on island. Um, so that, that's, that was kind of my story. And, and, and again, through the years, thanks to, you know, the work that all of you have done, it really helped kind of inform and guide me along on my, on my uh, journey. You know, one thing that is, um something that we all share here and, and, and there's a larger community that's not here on this panel that shares it is that um, we all really care about this community and, uh, and we pay a special kind of attention that I think is unique, uh, I would say, um, to our island community about how we care about everyone's story and, <clears throat> and how we care about preserving it, <clears throat> making it accessible to families, um, you know, to educational uh, for educational opportunities, and just to document what happened in the past, you know, and that's why I think that the, this uh, all those tapes behind both of you, Joan and um, uh, Janelle, is so important, and how important it will be into the future as we um, as we migrate them to uh, digital format, so we so it can be much more accessible than it is right now. Um, so, you know, I mahalo the, the kind of work that you do out there on, on your island. And, uh, and I think it's really the most ideal working situation in the planet, on the planet that you have, Matt. And yes, I'm envious. And here I am from Oahu telling you <laughs> that your situation is fabulous. And, uh, and so um, I, I wanted to also bring up this cultural protocol that has risen with the rise of all of us um, uh, in terms of our attention to the details of, um, of cultural programming and documentation, how you do it on your island and what you can share and what you, what you think others should do. So I, I'm not native Hawaiian by ancestry, but I grew up in a very Hawaiian place and all of my friends were native Hawaiian. So, you know, that's, that's a culture I probably feel most connected to. Um, and returning back home to tell stories that were very much so Hawaiian stories, many of them, um, and very much so Molokai stories. I mean, my, my whole career, I think, really has been built on this idea of telling stories that are close to me because they're a part of this island. Um, and, and in that process, you know, um, just along the way, learning in my own personal life more about Hawaiian culture and practices and protocols, how you approach elders, how you approach sacred places, how you approach events, how you approach going into the ocean, you know, is, is there's, there's protocol. And, and, and in filmmaking, 
you realize at a certain point with the kind of work we do, I think, I think we can all agree that, you know, oftentimes we are crossing into sacred spaces. We very often are putting ourselves in a place where we do need guidance um, and we do need to be in tune and, and aligned with uh, the powers and the forces and the, and the ancestors uh, that, that surround us um, to tell that story correctly. And, and, and I think through the years, uh, you know, that has evolved into just a practice of when, and, and we really, we've, we've really actually kind of got this to a place where when outside productions come to our island, whether they're from another island or very often from New York or California and they wanna come and tell a story that is a Molokai story for whatever reason, um, you know, we really developed this strict protocol so that these incoming um, crews will one, be able to understand and respect our island, who we are, how we operate, what makes us different. Um, and then also be completely aware at all times while on set or while filming that they are um, being granted um, a special opportunity. That they're, you know, that this is not something anybody can just come charging in and film or shoot or interview. Um, and, and therefore there comes, there is a process of coming in with a level of respect, understanding and asking permission because a lot of the protocol is about asking permission. And in that process, having those crews as well as ourselves when we're filming to constantly be open and aware to other uh, signs maybe um, that may guide you through the day because sometimes as filmmakers, we get really caught up. And I see that especially with the LA and the New York mindset coming to island. They got to get their shot, you know, they got to, they got to stay on schedule, you know, they're paying everybody on their crew. But what we tell them is the most important thing is being in tune to what the natural world is trying to instruct you in terms of what you're doing and where you are. Um, and we require, we, we don't, re we can't force anybody, but if they want to work with us, we require that they hire a cultural consultant. Um, I don't consider myself a cultural consultant. We have two really amazing um, Hawaiian practitioners that uh, fill that role really well. And so they're on set at all times, basically to keep the crew tuned in, right? They'll stop the crew in the middle of a shoot and say, you know what, you guys, the energy is getting weird. Let's just take a breather. Let's pull it or let's circle up. Let's, let's meditate for a second. Or they might be inspired to do a chant and Oli. Um, and they're watching the elements, right? It's time to leave. The clouds are gathering. Uh, it, we're done here. And the crew has to, the crew has to respect those decisions. And I, I can say it's been a really amazing um, experience watching these crews from outside come in, agree to this, and then have the best shoots that they've ever had. You know, so often they leave saying like, you know, the DPs, the directors, the producers, they, they always leave saying things like that was the best shoot I was ever on. Or I had a producer from New York once come in and, and, and he left and he said, you know what? I'm usually so strung out on my, on my shoots. He's like, I felt relaxed the whole time. I felt like everything was okay, you know? It's, and it's your island. <laughs> it, so, you know, that, that's kind of our protocol and it's worked well. Um, yeah. That's great, Matt. I really wanted to sh have you share that and I really appreciate that. Um, so Leah, do you teach your students about um, a cultural approach? that leads up to what Matt was practices out in the field? Um, when I first started, because my training was more of a Western training um, at USC, and um, I, I totally relate to what Matt is saying. It was always about got to get the shot. You know, there's time, is money and all of that. And that was always kind of like what's at the forefront. Um, but even for myself, as I look back, I'm like, why didn't I have more of a cultural perspective um, integrated into that? And so therefore, I think that's the benefit um, to our future generations in being able to create a norm where our culture plays equal value <laughs> to um, all those other kind of protocols as well. And so one of the first things with my video class we look at is what is a Hawaiian story and what is a Hawaiian film? And it's a wonderful conversation because students don't really like think about it. You know, like in our generation where media is so close and you're like so quick to, to you know, to hit anything on YouTube and be able to watch it instantly um, to really kind of step back and think about it. And it was funny because the kids said, I'm going to do a Google search. 
and they typed in Hawaiian film and the first thing that came out was 51st date. And, you know, the kids all agreed, we love this movie, it's super funny, but this is not a Hawaiian film. And it just opened the door, um, you know, to a conversation that we've had all semester long. And the kids themselves were, be, were able to kind of, um, you know, figure out what they felt were elements. And then when we go into the production, it's the same kind of protocols. Um, like Matt says, it's um, who, who do you get permission from? And how do you know you're granted that permission? You know, we're thought, you know, we think it's like, okay, you've got your film permits um, when you're coming from that Western scope. And you're like, okay, so I'm okay to go shoot. But then when you're going to a culturally sensitive place, it is asking for permission from people who may not physically be there, right? So there comes the pule, you know, oli. And then it's like being able to take the time to observe and listen for the response, you know? And so those are things I think is cool because my students learn them um, firsthand and um, getting these kind of lessons, like you can't find it anywhere else, um, being able to just practice it. So you said, um, and I appreciate you sharing that, uh, but I, you said a word that made me think of something else, the word permission, which leads us to collections of Namaka Oka Aina and Victoria Keith Productions and all the collections that are in Ulu Ulu. Uh, the access that people have to use them um, just purely to study, to, to collect them for their families or to um, use them commercially in, in documentaries or or um, public service announcements or whatever. Um, the, uh, could you explain how your uh, the process of if somebody finds something uh, Janelle in the and then how it's used? Because then I want to loop it back to the owner, and then talk about um, how uh, Matt you've accessed and Leah you've accessed footage and, and incorporated it into whatever you your needs are today. Yeah. So at Ulu Ulu, um, one of the major goals that we have is preservation and access. And because of that, we're, we're not, for the most part, the copyright owners of the collections in our material, uh, the materials in our collection. Um, but we work, and, and so the copyrights remain with the content creators. So for example, Heather's collection, Juni Roa Productions, um, is held at Ulu Ulu, but Heather um, and Junior Royal Productions still owns the copyright to the content that's recorded on the videotapes. Um, and so what we do at Ulu Ulu is as items get digitized, we make um, short clips available through our online catalog at uluulu.hawaii.edu. So anybody with internet access can go online, they can search our catalog, they can watch a short clip um, just to get a sense of what that full length footage looks like. Um, and as a researcher, they can contact us, register as a researcher and request to view the full length program um, with a secret streaming link that we provide temporarily so that people can watch full length content. Um, and, and so that purpose is all free of charge. People can come in and view and use um, view and access the material for educational purposes and for research. But if the request goes further and that researcher then wants to either receive a copy or to use a portion of that video in a new edited production, um, then the archive, us at the archive, will um, put them in contact with the copyright owner so that those permissions can be um, reviewed and granted. And then we work with all of the parties involved to get those copies out and to help that process along with um, um, any permissions that need to be granted. Um, and so it's great to work with, you know, filmmakers like Matt and with Leah, with your students who come in and do research with us um, to search our collections to find footage that is relevant to the projects that you're currently working on. Um, and we've done that, you know, so many times, um, most recently with the, um, the song contest, the 100 anniversary of song contest with um, um, Kamehameha schools. And um, so being able to put researchers in direct contact with the filmmakers and the copyright owners of the collections that we hold is really key just to make sure that um, everything is done appropriately and that copyright is honored and that um, our work at the archive can make sure that we make those connections between um, the 
filmmakers whose collections we hold, as well as the filmmakers who want to be able to use it in, in brand new productions. And Matt, you use um, the archive as well, right? Yeah, I've used the archive uh, a number of times for a number of different films. Um, and it's, it's an incredible resource, you know, I, I kind of wanted to share like what I've, what I've realized over time is that the stories we tell are extensions of older stories and it's a continuation of those stories, right? The, the first time I realized that was one of the first documentaries I shot here, we were protesting cruise ships from coming to the island. And on the day the cruise ship was supposed to arrive and land their little boats, the winds of Molokai kicked up so powerfully that they couldn't transport, transport people to shore. Molokai Nui Hina, Molokai the great child of the goddess Hina. Hina in, of antiquity and the Hawaiian culture is known for her winds. And she would use her winds to protect the island. And you know, just in filming that and documenting it, and then later making that connection, like, wow, you know, I mean, that's how far back it goes, right? These are continuations. We're still telling stories that are ancient and, and modern, but they're all connected. And, and to me, that's what Ulu Ulu really represents in a lot of ways. I mean, working with, working with Joan and with Joan's footage and working with Vicky's footage um, on, on a, a number of different short and long, uh, longer form documentaries, you know, that's a continuation of that as well. And, and the fact that we have the moving images, you know, uh, in safekeeping and accessible and searchable uh, just makes our work easier and also more powerful because it keeps that connectivity to the story alive, I feel. Yes, it does. I it takes it. Go ahead, Janelle. Oh, I also wanted to mention um, earlier in the conversation, Vicky um, was talking about how um, when you uh, edited Sand Island Story for broadcast on PBS, you were um, you had to edit down to 26 minutes and that it was such a shame because you had recorded so many hours of footage of interview of people um, at Sand Island. And so I just wanted to mention that one of the treasures at Ulu Ulu is the fact that we can, um, that we have all of that raw footage. So not just your finished documentary, but all of the raw footage and interviews that were recorded to make that documentary so that people now can, you know, access all of the footage that didn't make it into the final edited um, project. Yeah, and some uh, producers have used clips in their productions uh, that we were not able to use in ours. So some of it is being brought out to life once again, which is nice. Yes, all of us old filmmakers can die in peace knowing that we're protected by Ulu Ulu. <laughs> Joan, um, you were recently honored um, with your film being, the, your film Mauna Kea Temple Under Siege being named to the Library of Congress's National Film Registry this past year. And this is a huge, huge accomplishment and a huge honor because um, I know that they only select 25 films each year and those films have to have cultural and historical significance. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that film and what it means to you to be named to the National Film Registry and what that means for Hawaii film in general. Mm. Well, it was a total surprise for this to happen. Uh, we made the, the, we finished the, the documentary back in 2006. It went on PBS stations around the country. It aired on PBS Hawaii twice. And that was pretty much it. It kind of, you know, all kind of distribu distributing to schools and colleges and universities, as is our usual um, practice. Um, it wasn't seen that much. It was shown in the community. But this is what I want to say. Um, I really feel that the past few years of what's been happening on the Mauna, all of the video, all of the uh, outreach that's happening online about that issue is really what brought the awareness, the general awareness about Mauna Kea to, to the fore. You know, it kind of increased the zeitgeist. And I have a real I have a real feeling that that's why Mauna Kea Temple Under Siege might have been selected because the panel possibly, this is just my guess, the panel reviewing the entries were made aware of the Mauna Kea issue on the, in the last couple of years through the efforts of 
you know, the younger generation of filmmakers who are doing incredible work, you know, uh, getting it out there and live, live streaming and everything else. Anyway, I really feel that that's what, what happened. It's still a fantastic film. It's incredible. Well, I think it kind of laid the basis for things mm -hmm. and then maybe the, the younger, um, what I really liked about the whole thing is that the, the, the issue brought forth resistance and, and protesting and everything that was very culturally based. You know, instead of yelling these slogans like, hell no, we won't go and stuff like, you know, what we used to do in the old days, they're chanting their chants, they're doing their dances, and it's just, it's such a great way to resist. <laughs> anyway, that's my comment. But mahalo to you. Anyway, because I know you had something to do with it, and also I heard from the Native American consortium that they also had recommended it. So there was a lot of people behind this, and I feel it was a—it's not just a recognition of us; it's really a recognition of this whole bringing to awareness of what's happening with the Hawaii story, you know, coming to the fore, and how the activism has spread to the iPhone. Exactly. From these fifty, sixty-pound cameras to. Uh, to a mere little phone. Things you can put in your pocket. Oh, lucky buggers. <laughs> yeah. And all the many multiple um, uh, uh, programs uh, that in the last year that have come out about um, the Mauna. It's been just really remarkable getting recognition, going around. I mean, social media and uh, the internet has done wonders. <laughs> well, that's uh, that. Okay, I think that wraps it up. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you to all of you, all my friends that are here in um, in front of me on this online panel, unique situation because of COVID. We all look forward to the time where we can actually be on a panel together in person, and uh, and hug each other up as we love doing in uh, in the best way. And I really, I'm thrilled that you um, made, the, um, made this opportunity happen um, for this event and this film festival. Um, because of you, because of filmmakers, past, present, and future, the archive, the movie the image archive exists. Because of the archive, we can preserve amazing footage uh, for future generations to access. I love all the work that you folks have done, Namakoka Aina, Victoria Keith Productions. Uh, there's so much that we haven't talked about, all the individual programmings that we have uh, done uh, separately and together um, it, with Junior World Productions, which had its own uh, lifespan and career, which did um, produce a lot of programming, which uh, hasn't been digitized, but that, that is my fault of not cataloging it well, but it's in the great hands of uh, Janelle. And then Matt, um, you know, I've always admired you over the years doing great programming and you, your films have been exquisite. And I look forward to all your future films. And then Leah, for all the work that you've done and as a early, a early filmmaker, what you produced, I thought truly you were gonna be the biggest, greatest director that's ever was seen. Um, but I'm very proud of all the work that you continue to do. Thank you very much for this opportunity and we will sign off. Mahalo to you, Heather, and Janelle, and Taylor, and Sarah, and everybody. It's been great. Yep. Thank you. Mahalo. Mahalo, you guys. Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo.